I left with over $130,000 of debt, which was just like crippling. I'm not gonna be out of debt until I'm in middle 40s. And that was just terrifying to me. So I saw trading as maybe the tool that could get me out of that debt and just creating a positive net worth. Hey guys, before we get into this incredible episode of Words of Wisdom, I want to let you know how you can get a free trading plan. Very simple. Go in the link below, you're going to see two links. One for Telegram, there you'll get free mindset hacks, a free technical course, free updates and polls on the podcast. And then the other link is our new email newsletter. Click that link, sign up, you'll get a free trading plan PDF sent directly to you and get incredible value all week long. Let's get into this episode. Welcome everyone to the Words of Wisdom podcast. We're back once again. And we're still the number one trading podcast in the world, thanks to all of you and our incredible guests. Talking of which, we have a guest all the way from the United States. I normally go US of A, but I didn't <laughs> do it this time. But United States, he is here in my home studio, which we haven't been in for a while. And he is Ben Chafee. I got it right? Yeah. yeah I got it right? It, yeah. Nailed it. And just to tell you a little background information, Ben Shafee actually is a futures trader and he paid off his college. Yep. They call it college there, right? College debt, all by using prop firms and from trading, which is absolutely incredible. And we're going to get into that journey straight away. And I think with yourself, Ben, why don't we just get into how long you've been trading for? Yeah, first picked up trading lightly in 2018. 2019 is kind of when I really started taking it serious. Uh, so this will be six years in the market now. Um, in 2024, but picked it up in 2018 uh, while I was finishing up college, going into grad school, uh, just because I was interested about it, right? A lot of engineers, actually, we see them eventually maybe get like master's in finance because they enjoy the personal finance side of things. That's just how I picked it up, was seeing some other people in the space that I respected or just even other engineers that were like, hey, you got to learn investing if you want to build any sort of net worth. So that's what made me pick it up originally, was just interested in it. Um, and then I found the high strike course company I used to work for uh, is what got me started though, because, you know, I, I had no education, uh, no professional education or anything like that, right? Because my, my degrees were engineering. So I knew nothing about it, just wanted to give it a shot. But why trading? Like, obviously, as you said, you've heard other people talk about it. But like, why? What was it about trading that kept you there? You know, yeah, you've ended up, I don't think you do anything to do with engineering now, right? Nope, even to none do at all. Degree? Yeah, none at all. So Ben Zogby, founder of High Strike, he actually went to the same college I did, oh, Worcester really? Polytech. Yeah, and we, funny enough, we actually went to high school together, but we weren't good buddies until we went to the same college. Yeah, enemies. No, 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 I just mean by like, you you know, when close, we say what's yeah. up in the hallways, mm -hmm. he's a year older than me. So okay. like, you know what I mean? Like, respected him, didn't know much about him at the time though. We go to college together, like obviously being from the same hometown. Again, like say what's up to each other. He wrestled, I played baseball, so our paths didn't cross a ton. Mm -hmm. We'd just say what's up to each other. Um, I mean, I watched him go and, you know, he did his first six-figure month. I believe it, it had to be early 2020, probably. Wow. And that, for me, I was like, oh, this trading stuff's really serious. And that's what I mean, 2018, 2019, I was just kind of playing around, trying to get a feel for what mm -hmm. the stock market was. But it was end of 2019 and going into 2020 that I was like, oh, people are making legit money here. So that's kind of when I was like, okay, maybe I should look into day trading more because 2018, 2019, really just buy and hold strategy, a few options, contracts to give it a try, but didn't really know what I was doing. It was late 2019 going into 2020 is kind of when I was like, oh, there's some real money to be made here. And then obviously COVID and everything kind of excelled the learning curve because I went through like my first bear market cycle really with that, which mm -hmm. was scary, but good for me to see, I think. But it really was Ben Zogby's success story. Him being a former engineer, I mean, same college and everything, watching oh, wow. him mm -hmm. go scale his income. That's kind of what I was like, I need to be chasing this too. Like, you know what I mean? We come from somewhat similar background. Mm -hmm. um, just having a lot of respect for him and inspired by him is what made me want to go chase that because he obviously quit his job as an engineer pretty early too. I think he only did it for about 18 months, which is pretty much what I did too. Mm -hmm. I was like 25 months or something total in the engineering world. That was it. Um, but watching him scale his income and find that freedom that I was like, okay, I want some disposable income too. I didn't have plans to necessarily quit my job. That was never really my intention of trading at all. 
was just to get out of debt, um, which like we said, we'll kind of get into, I guess I can start to speak on that. Um, so my undergrad was mechanical engineering, my master's biomedical engineering. I finished everything in 2020. Um, and I left with over $130,000 of debt, which was just like crippling, obviously. And you know, the American education system and stuff is extremely predatory on like young minds, putting them in the debt that they don't understand. Um, and that's obviously you're seeing, you know, people go back and forth on student debt relief and stuff mm -hmm. and all that is because honestly, I don't think it's explained well enough to these young kids, 17 years old. I didn't realize how much debt I was really putting myself in. And thankfully I got good degrees that I would eventually get out of debt, but I was doing the math. I was like, I have to be broke all the time and I'm not going to be out of debt until I'm in middle forties. And that was just terrifying to me. So I saw trading as maybe the tool that could get me out of that debt. So that was kind of the background and the driving force was not necessarily quit my job or anything, but I was like, I don't want to take 20, 30 years to get out of debt because how am I going to buy a house? How am I, how am I going to have any freedom? So that's what got me started was honestly just the terrifying the crippling <laughs> yeah. debt. Yeah, it really was. It was the fear. It was the fear of being in that forever. With your, with your degrees, what sort of job would you have been able to go into or can, yeah, I yeah. guess, still go into? Sure. So I worked on some manufacturing floors, like as an intern stuff while I was in school with the mechanical degree. Um, did some stuff actually in sports medicine as well. I worked at Mass General Hospital for a summer. That's the stuff I really wanted to do was like biomechanics. That's what the focus was of my master's. Again, starting to realize how much debt that was. The sports medicine stuff is amazing. The entry level jobs we're talking maybe less than 60 grand in some oh, places. Wow. So that's what actually pushed me towards biotech with pharmaceuticals. Um, so I worked at AbbVie for a while. I worked at Takeda for a while. Takeda was my last engineering job before I actually started, you know, pursuing trading full time. Um, and I was a high strike student. I mentioned at the beginning, mm -hmm. I kind of stood out as a shining student. So I was brought on uh, to be an admin for the group and everything is kind of one of their success stories. So that's what actually got me to eventually leave engineering was my trading income paired with, I was on salary at high strike too, just to be transparent with people. Mm -hmm. um, so that's actually what got me, you know, pursuing trading full time was helping around high strike as one of their success stories, just a student they found. And then again, erasing that debt. One thing I just want to go back to quickly, which was so interesting is that you had someone you knew, you know, physically yeah. knew who had become successful at trading. And I think that's very helpful for traders but it's very rare for traders to yeah. experience. I had a similar thing. How I got into trading was a good friend of mine had done very very well and you could see it as well. And he told me about it. So I already knew it was possible because he's already done it and I've yeah. seen him do it. Seeing that proof um, is huge. And he didn't obviously, you know, at that, at that time he didn't sell anything or anything. And even if he did, I knew him, so it was fine. Um, and yeah, so I was like, okay, of course it's real because he's doing it. Yep. Versus a lot of people see it online and then they, I've had loads of messages. I'm sure you may have had it. I'm not sure if you've had these sort of messages, but they messaged me saying, Riz, I've been trading for X number of years. It's not gone well. Is it even possible to trade? Yeah. Is it even a real thing? And I always find that interesting because it's like a lot of people really don't know any other traders. Mm -hmm. So how helpful was it for you to actually see someone who was in, like you said, a similar environment and similar path, <laughs> almost identical. Yeah, almost, yeah um, But had become successful at it. You know, was that something that really made it much easier? No, I don't want to say easier, but like it, in terms of the belief of making more, it possible. Much more encouraging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say encouraging is like probably the word I would mm -hmm. use to describe it. I was just like, it is real. I've seen like exactly what you're saying. I have proof right in front of me of somebody I know personally watching him do it. Um, and then the community, I mean, High Strike was able to build. I mean, we had over 10,000 students you know, in our lifetime, you know, so getting to meet these other traders, which again, remember I started out as a student, like I wasn't the one that created the product or anything. I used the product. It's a general educational course, like, you know, really good for beginners. It's, I would say more advanced in trading. You probably wouldn't get as much out of it, but to a new green trader, mm -hmm. it was everything I needed to understand options and how to actually trade them is pretty much how it went. But meeting those thousands of other traders that were in a similar learning curve to me, Ben Zogby was the encouraging proof. I need to get started, but it was learning with the other traders is really what built me up and kept me around. Um, you know, I have enough online friends I can chat with and stuff, but it was people that had a similar interest. And again, we're in a similar learning curve and similar struggles to me. Um, learning from them, I think is the best thing another trader can do is, and that's what we're talking about. It can be hard to find other traders. And I know some people, you know, people are mixed on 
Discord trading groups and stuff, and that's fair. I think you should be skeptical to an extent. I think people need to realize how valuable it is, though, to be able to go chat with other traders and learn from their mistakes. You know, you teach them about your mistakes. That's really when you can all of a sudden be like, oh, I have some trading friends uh, because of these communities. And obviously there's, I mean, there's thousands out there. I would say just go with which one you see as encouraging proof, right? Get your foot in the door somehow and then learn from other traders along the way. I like that. No, I like that a lot. And in terms of options, you mentioned options a couple of times. Is that where you started in terms of your trading yep. journey? Yep. So well, shares first, mm -hmm. then options. Uh, yeah. And what was what was the journey in terms of like the yeah. different sectors you've been in? Yeah. So I mean, options are the reason why I actually got into prop firm. We can talk about a little bit my journey, my struggles and stuff mm -hmm. with trading. So with options, I've watched myself turn a $15,000 account into just over six figures. Wow. And then wait, as you've heard plenty of times on this, lost it all, mm -hmm. right? Built that back up to let's say like 20, flip that to like 80. what I do? Lose it all again. And then I did the same thing with like 30 grand, flipped it up to right around 100, lost it down to like 10. And I really, really think that six figure debt overhead, to be honest, that's what I think put me in that mental space because whole thing of trading I was thinking, right, was if I can make an extra 130 grand, I'm free. So I'll get to that 100 point mark and just think if I can flip this account once more, I can just take a $100,000 withdrawal, pay off my debt and still have a six figure account to trade. Mm -hmm. That's like where I wanted to see myself in the trading space is just like six figure account and debt free. Obviously, I kept getting to that six figure account, blowing it because I was just forcing it trying to flip it that one last time. Prop firms, I saw, oh, I can get, you know, a six figure payout and still have a six figure account, right? That I could trade mm -hmm. over and over again. So that's really why I found prop firms in particular was the opportunity that I have to pay myself. I have to treat this like a business. And then I still have that six figure account to trade. So, but it went shares, options, started checking out the prop space, trading some futures, mostly CFDs when you know, it was legal, or shouldn't say legal, but when uh, synthetic CFDs were available to trade in the US for the last, I mean, realistically, what, last like four years? Mm -hmm. I was, wasn't was on the train for the full four years. It was probably like two and a half years I was trading with Forex based props. Um, and now, obviously, everything going on in the US to have transferred over to futures completely. Um, but yeah, that was kind of the journey going, the steps I took along the way. And how, when you had done the, the, the flips, right? Yeah. And it makes sense in terms of like what you were trying to do was you didn't want to withdraw just to be debt free. You wanted to withdraw, but still then, have an account. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, because I'd built up, I clearly had proven myself, I built a really good skill, right? You can't can't get yourself to that level multiple times without there being some skill there, right? It was too, it happened too many times for it to be luck, right? Mm -hmm. um, when you did those, was it very high risk positions or was it just a case of like doing it, maybe with some high risk, but it was not just one position? That yeah, never went, no, like it, it typically was like, let's say five, five months in each of those okay, cycles. Yeah. I'm kind of talking so it wasn't like, like it wasn't, a quick flip. No, 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 it was like five months of each one. That's what I mean. I've been trading for six years and you can see the first year didn't really know what I was doing. Second year started to figure out it was the like three, really second to fourth year. So it was like two, three, four. Mm -hmm. That's kind of when I was going through those cycles of like, I'm right there, lose it all. I'm right there, lose it all. And then it's been years five and six. That's when I got into like the prop space. So that's kind of what it's all looked like. So five, year five and six, I have been profitable in all the years, year five and six are really the mm -hmm. last two years. That's when I've got myself out of debt and finally move in the right direction. It feels like I'm finally obviously out of the crippling debt, but like <laughs> now I, you know, now first time I'm 27, mm -hmm. I never had a positive net worth for 27 because of all that debt. You know, and now that like, that's the stage I'm kind of in now is I want to continue to trade, but I'm really excited to finally be out of the hole and I can, you know, be building up businesses, trading and just creating a positive net worth, you know, and that's something I didn't feel until this year, 27, you know, so. Did you always think you'd get into sort of entrepreneurship sort of trading, even though you're going through the sort of uh, the usual education route. Let's take a break for a minute there, guys, because I want to tell you about the best prop firm in the entire industry, Alpha Capital. Let's keep it nice and simple. You want to get paid out. You want to have institutional experience behind the firm. You want to have their own broker so that you can trade on the best platform that all traders love to use. And on top of which, they have their own technology as well. So you know they're here for the long term. Alpha Capital has no commissions as well as part of their trading conditions, which is absolutely incredible. And not only that, they're London's finest. Now, if you want to join them, 20% off using the code RIZ, and the link is in the description below. Now, let's get back to the episode. 
a little bit, right? Like my, I guess like dream situation when I was in school and stuff was to be able to design a medical device and then not necessarily just market it myself, but right, design something, create a product that was within my education of biomedical. Um, but yeah, still like maybe, I don't know if it was create my own company or just create my own medical device. Like that's that was like what my dream job kind of would have been. So a little bit, you know, a mm -hmm. little bit, I think the entrepreneurship was interesting to me, but I didn't know how to approach it at all, right? As no young does it stem does. stem from anywhere any entrepreneurship in the family or anything like that? so my mom actually started her own business it was only five years ago now wow incredible. yeah yeah so she she got a late start and she's just crushing it now um she's basically a middleman for manufacturer so i grew up about an hour outside of boston she lives anybody listening knows cape cod she um a lot of mom and pop like gift shops down there she's basically the middleman between the manufacturers of like gifts you'll see in touristy spots mm -hmm. and the mom and pop shop. So she had, she represents a bunch of like different gift lines, but she just started doing that. It, it might be close to six years ago now um, because she was just fed up with her boss. She was in greeting cards for a long time, doing sales and stuff there. She just got fed up with her boss one day and quit and started her own thing. So Sorry. she's been a she's been a huge inspiration for me on the entrepreneurship side of things. But even to her, it's she's still, you know, I mean, green to the space. She's only been doing it for a few years. Mm -hmm. um, so before that, no, it was all just kind of personal interest, figuring out. And then, you know, my mom doing what she does is a huge inspiration now. I can imagine. It's always good, I think, to see other people take risks as yeah. well, you know? Yep. Because then it's like, because it seems like it was coinciding when you started trading around that sort of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because no, you don't see it too often. You know, you see people talk about their dreams, talk about yeah. they want to, I don't like my job. Yeah. But then it's like, Okay, what are you going to do about it then? Yep. You know? It's one thing saying it once because you had a bad day or you just not, didn't enjoy it that day. But if it's a reoccurring theme, you see people do it. Like, I remember uh, when I was younger, I quit a job where I was going to quit and the person was like, you're so lucky. And I was like, why? They're like, because you can just quit. And I was like, you can quit too. Like, what's, yeah. what do you mean? <laughs> like, if you want to quit, quit. Like, what, what right. do you mean? Um, and I get it in terms of like, maybe I was in a position where, uh, you know, not having the income, I was fine still because I was very young at the time. Um, so I get that perspective, but it's like, okay, if you're not happy somewhere, take the risk, you know, right. go somewhere else, find something else, yeah. do something else. I think know? especially where I kind of be like, I don't know, like I'm, I'm not a parent, mm -hmm. right? Like I don't have kids that rely on me and stuff. So that's, but yeah, if you're no kids, it's all no, yeah, yeah, I think it, honestly, I would totally agree. If you mm -hmm. got no kids, why not take the risk? Right. Cause I can understand people who have kids and stuff. You have somebody to look after. Mm -hmm. And that's something I'm not in parenthood yet. Like I don't have the perspective on, but I can tell, you know, mm -hmm. young men and women, if you don't have kids, yeah, I should tell you, you should go take that risk. You know, like I was scared as hell to do it, but you know, it's worked out now then, you know, and I know you've had, you know, multimillionaires on this podcast and stuff, and I'm just talking about finally getting to a positive net worth now. I didn't think that would happen until I was like 45 though. You know, and that's what unfortunately, the engineering track set me up for. Mm -hmm. And you know, that, what engineers do you know that are struggling, right? I wouldn't have been struggling, but I would have never had a positive net worth until I did have kids that were probably, you know, 10, yeah. 15 years yeah. old at that point. Um, so yeah, just very happy to finally be, feels like finally moving out like, of the whole, you know. Being in that position though, because it is true that, you know, you've shortened that time horizon down for yourself yeah. and you're 27 with a positive network, which is already a, such a, in terms of the ladder of success, if you will, mm -hmm. people always assume, and I was guilty of this, I used to think like, you know, loads of people were millionaires and, yeah. and so on and so forth. And there are a lot of them in the world, but in the grand scheme, it's a small percentage. Um, so like you being in that position now at 27 has already put yourself in terms of a success ladder, probably here. But right. in our minds sometimes before you yeah. think it's there. And yep. the, the majority of the audience, unfortunately, probably think it's there. Yeah. Just because they don't understand that actually doing that at 27 puts you actually right there. And you put yourself in a position now where in the next, say, before you're 30, right. again, now there. Right. You know? Yeah. Um, and I think that it's actually something to be very proud of, you know, it's very proud of and, and to really highlight. Because one of my questions to you would actually be that majority of people in the entrepreneurial space, you know, Wi-Fi money more mm -hmm. so, uh, but it's very like anti-education. You yeah, know, really against education. Yeah. A lot of you know, dropout. I didn't yep. actually go personally. Yeah, not because I had anything against it. I just didn't know what I wanted to do. Yeah. So therefore, I didn't want to just do go and do business. You know, like mm -hmm. a lot of people they go and do business or IT or some sort of I don't want to do that, but easy degree, um, just because for the sake of going right. Yep. So I didn't want to do that, but I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur and, and sort of be a businessman. I didn't know what that meant at the time, of course. But um, 
So I, I, I kind of said, okay, there's no point in me going if I don't want to know what I want to do. Let me just go and work and, and work some stuff out. But I see so many people where they've started to go and then they've come across e com or mainly trading, obviously, yep. because of my conversations. And they're like, I want to go all in trading. I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit, quit uni, quit college, whatever, and then go all in on trading. And they, yeah, they have no, no edge yet, no profitability. Yeah. Really, I've seen people, not even in that position, I've seen people where they had businesses, they closed their business just to go all in trading. They get no edge, no nothing. And they think if I've got enough money for my business one year, that's all it takes. That's scary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. scary. Which I know we're talking about like, hey, I encourage people to go take risk. But <laughs> yeah. you, gotta, you gotta put food on the table for yourself too though, mm-hmm. like realizing, you know, I even talked about my first two years trading. I didn't really know what I was doing. I mm-hmm. actually made some money those first two years, but like, you know what I mean? It was not sustainable. It would, that was luck. You know what I mean? Um, it was after like year two that, that I was like, oh, I, I built the skill here and I went through obviously everything we talked about it, just pretty much being a dumbass and <laughs> letting again that overhead debt just get to me. Did um, it help having a degree though at the time? Like knowing that, okay, I have this other skill. So I have the skill set of trading and developing, but I have this skill set that I've learned about and I can apply and have a job that yeah. gives me an income. Yeah, so, I mean, I wasn't getting paid great as an engineer, but it was good enough that, like, I could pay my bills, I could, you know, pay my monthly um, fee with the with the debt and everything, obviously. Um, the loan payment, that's the word I was looking for. I could pay my loan payments, you know, I could pay for my car, and then I still had money left over to try trading and obviously, you know, losing it and then gaining it back, losing it. So I was making enough money that that gave me comfort that I could keep trying this even if I wasn't, a perfect trade or anything yet i was like it's okay it's part of the learning process like it's not like i'm being stupid taking out loans to go continue to trade i was using my disposable income to learn a skill that i believed would help scale that disposable income and that's what I me mean. at the time i always thought i'd be a full-time engineer forever part-time trader and use that to still get out of debt it just turned into something way bigger that you know i was able to do over six figures in prop payouts last year and just lump sum everything gone so it turned into a much more aggressive situation than I ever really intended it to be. And that, again, was taking that risk to, mm-hmm. you know, again, I was salary at high strike because I was one of their success students. But taking that jump from cutting engineering out of my life is when I made huge, huge progress in my trading and why I was able to do it again even faster than I thought, you know, from the start. Um, but my degrees, I do value them. Even I mean, I know engineering degrees, they're definitely not easy to come by. Mm-hmm. I'm proud of that. I think that's what it set me up for though, is to be able to handle pretty much any workload somebody throws at me. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, mechanical engineering is not easy. It's definitely not the toughest in the world. Like I think chemical engineers, honestly, that's, that might be a little bit harder, I would say. Um, Biomedical, same thing, like very difficult. I would say chemical is probably a little bit tougher, but I was a student athlete at the time too. I played baseball in college. So learning how to balance, like baseball is a huge passion of mine. I still coach now actually learning to balance, yeah, having good fun with friends. Like I had a good college experience, baseball and of course doing well in, in school to be able to get a job. Mm-hmm. I think that prepared me to be able to handle pretty much any workload somebody throws my way. So that is why I really do value my degrees even though I'll probably never use them again. <laughs> you know, I do value them because of that because I think it set me up for very fast I think it gave you skill sets that were transferable into the learning trading? Um, the problem solving mm-hmm. mindset, I would say, but I, I would say like, because even like what I was going to reflect on is like the workload you mentioned. Mm-hmm. So in that two years of you learning, you were working and yeah. you had other things. Yep. And a lot of people are in that position, right? Mm-hmm. When they first start fine trading, they, they've got a job or they're at university or they're at college or they have a business or maybe they have kids or whatever it may be. Or, or you know, kids and then more layers on top of it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and the main issue that they normally face is time, time yep. management. Yep. So was that something that, you know, you having all those things during the college years and then building a degree, were you sort of already built a sort of how to manage time, manage your, yourself? Absolutely. Be able to still fulfill those areas. Yep, absolutely, no doubt. And again, I don't have kids, so I know people with kids in the comments will be like, yeah, you'll see when you have kids, it's not the same. <laughs> I try to, I also do some personal training stuff on the yeah. side too. Like I clearly like to keep myself busy. I can never do one thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but you just have to make time for anything you care about. And that's what a lot of people are like, how do I get started trading? I have a full-time job, I don't have time. I'm like, well, you need to decide, do you care a lot about trading or just a little bit? And they're like, well, I don't know. Then I was like, then don't bother. If you don't think you care about it, don't, don't stress yourself out and do it. If this is something you think 
could change your life and you believe that because whether you've seen a friend do it or you know somebody online really connected with you and you're like no that person has encouraged me then you have to make time for it make time what you care for what you care about um you know and a lot of times i while i was doing full-time engineering part-time um trading i was part-time personal trainer and baseball coach oh, wow. i would train my clients and train for me i'd be up four or five in the morning look at the market and stuff before market open try to get some work done before market open and then i block my calendar off for like an hour every day from like market open to 10 30 so nobody could book me meetings with me at that time and then go right back to work but you know what i mean i i had to create a schedule for myself that most people would probably be like oh screw that like that seems brutal kind of was but it was all worth it to me i decided i i need to find the mm -hmm. time i need to make the time for this so I think people just need was to- Was there an element or period of time though where you, you hadn't made that decision yet and it wasn't really working out too much? No, to be honest, I like, again, like I, I saw a good friend do extremely well with it. Like I made the commitment that I was like, I want to see did this Did you ever through. liaise with him of like, how did you do it? Yeah, oh yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So um, that's what I mean, he launched the high strike course and stuff like, so that, that was basically the answer I got because that is what he walks you through his whole journey and everything mm -hmm. in the course as well in the introduction. So, I mean, we talked on the phone and stuff and we've become very good friends since and everything. Um, but yeah, like when I was like, hey, I'm interested. I know nothing about the trading <laughs> space. Can you walk me through? Like I literally asked him on the phone. I was like, what's a broker? You mm -hmm. know, cause he was like, all right, you gotta open up a brokerage account. And I was like, all right, well, what is that? Cool. You know, so like he was very kind to give me his time to walk me through that. Mm -hmm. um, but there, it was pretty much right then that I was like, no, I'm committed. I wanna figure this out. Mm -hmm. And it was, just a long journey since then, but. In terms of that routine though, it sounded obviously here, 5 a.m. wake yeah. up, uh, managing your time, managing clients, managing meetings, you're trading. Um, but would you say the discipline of sticking to such a routine, the discipline of having to wake up with that, you know, basically mm -hmm. doing things that your body tells you and your mind probably tries to tell you at the beginning, don't do this, yeah. <laughs> you know, sleep in, we need more sleep, etc. cetera. Um, would you say the discipline is transferable into trade, helps with trading? Yeah, yeah. I'm. So I was once told the way you do one thing is the way you do everything. Mm -hmm. And I kind of try to apply that to all things in life. And I think honestly, like sports is probably what, it probably was a coach that said it to me. I actually don't remember where I originally heard it. I think it was a coach that probably said it to me. Um, you know, discipline obviously goes a long way in sports. That's what I think originally made me pick it up. My parents too, you know, they were, they are incredible. They, and they always, all the time, they're like, we don't know where this discipline comes from because like they see themselves as like undisciplined people. They're not, <laughs> I'm, 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 you know what I mean? I was like, you guys instilled this in me, like you guys raised me. Um, but I do like that saying, the way you do one thing is the way you do everything. So that discipline absolutely carries over because it it's pretty much right. If you set rules for yourself, how to live your life day to day, you're probably gonna do a better job setting rules for yourself trading is, you know, it's not a magic switch, but I think it helps for sure. How about sports? Because mm -hmm. I, I use sports, I use gym a lot as analogies in trading. Yeah. You know, it just really, it's an easy analogy, I think, to make. Mm -hmm. Because what about with yourself, baseball-wise? Did yeah. you start off good? I was all right, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, like I was an athletic kid, so mm -hmm. like my favorite sport was the one I was best at, so baseball oh, really? was yeah. pretty good for me. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, of course, you, if you wanna get better, you have mm -hmm. to work hard. Yeah. Like, yeah, like going into college, I was pretty average. Like I didn't know if I was gonna be playing okay. a lot and stuff, mm -hmm. right? Um, eventually worked my way up to like a three year starter. So obviously there was a lot of work in those first two years though, to get myself to that next level. Like I was good enough to play college ball. That was just kind of like being an athlete, but then obviously getting to start on a college team is another level that that's probably where I feel like my work ethic really had to take another step was because I was like, well, I'm not giving all this time to the sport, just not to play, right? Like I'm not going to sit on the bench and I by no means was an amazing player, but like I, I was like. I always wanted to be like the grit guy on the team, mm -hmm. right? That was disciplined, that was in the gym, that did things the right way. And that's, again, that's what I tried to carry over to trading, my job, engineering school, everything is like, all right, I'm gonna work hard and try to do things the right way. And I might not be the best. And that's even how I feel about trading. There are so many traders way better than me, but I think I do things the right way and I'm always willing to learn. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm always like, you know, I'm always trying to make adjustments to my strategy and stuff and like learn things. Like I know you're an ICT trader, not something I knew about until like a couple years ago. And I don't use like fair value gaps and stuff mm -hmm. in my style, but like now I, I notice a lot more like, oh, imbalance fill in the market. All right, I know the, the SMC guys, the ICT guys were all over that. Picking up that stuff and realizing 
hey, you gotta, you gotta be willing to learn. You gotta be willing to take things from other strategies and apply it to your own, not just, I don't know, being naive and creating your edge and then never trying to learn again. Mm -hmm. um, unless you're the most profitable trader in the world, which I'm not, you know, like if I was making five million a year, maybe I would just block out all other strategies, but I've never gotten to that point. I hope one day I do, but you know, that's why just again, try to do things the right way. Try to learn from people that are better for, than you. And that's huge in sports too, right? Watch the, watch the starter in front of me, watch what he does. Okay. How can I repeat what he does, right? If I just do it exactly the same, or what do I need to take from him that he does well? And how can I try to match that or at least put my own spin on it? That's, that's a huge thing for trading for me was watching these really good traders and being like, okay, you know, that stuff doesn't quite click with me, but I can add this piece of their analysis to my own. No, definitely. And, and I definitely love the analogy you just used there as well in terms of just observing others. Mm -hmm. And I think in trading is, it's like a double-edged sword. I always said like trading is, is a beautiful thing and a really dangerous thing at the same time, but yeah. it's for the same reason that anything works, right? Yeah. And um, because everything works, it's amazing because you're not limited. But it's also very negative because it's like, what do I use? What do I use yeah. that? Right? Because yep. anything can work. Yep. Um, so it's like, like with that, stick to your edge. Yes, learn, but be careful not to constantly change. Right? So yeah. it's like a double-edged sword yep. all the time. And I think that that's probably why trading so hard. Yep. Right? Because of that, because it's just so many options that yep. are just you can take, and it's about trying to learn what you should. Where's the balance? Yeah. Right? Because you should take moves in probably every decision that is there to a certain extent. Yeah. And I think that's why it probably becomes so difficult because as human beings, we're not good with probably making the best choices all the time. Right. Let alone when there's unlimited choices. <laughs> it's probably not, it's like a, a, a buffet that never ends. <laughs> just keeps going. <laughs> um, one thing I was gonna ask you though, about inside those two years when mm -hmm. you were learning, you had all these things going on, but what were like some of the biggest challenges you faced in that learning phase that you had to overcome? FOMO, right? Whether it be like missing a trade because I had, to go to work, right? Um, or just like, I don't wanna call it jealousy, but just like, how are these people making all this money? Like, why can't I do that, you know? Um, I mean, I didn't have the funds to do it at the time and my skills weren't built up enough at that point. And, you know, going back, if I could tell my younger self was like, hey, it's gonna take time to get there, but like you are on the right track, but like, hey, you gotta be more patient. So I think it was, it was really FOMO for me, whether like, and again, this is more maturity now. I wish I could tell myself then, hey, you're making more money as an engineer right now than you do as a trader. Engineering needs to be your focus. Like, yes, continue to make time for trading. You care about it, right? That's what I would tell most people that are kind of in the space, like working a good job, trying to figure out trading. Whichever one is making you more income needs to be the priority. And then yeah. find time in your day, you can go trade. I obviously encourage that. It's changed my life. Like I encourage people to do that, but if something pops up at work that you can't trade on Tuesday, that's okay. That's still where most of your income is. That needs to be the thing you prioritize. And then Wednesday, if you have a light day at work, awesome, spend more time trading. Um, so I think that FOMO kind of frustrated me for a while too. And I wish I kind of told myself, stop letting it frustrate you. Get your work done at the engineering job or you know grad school, whatever it was, get your work done, then come check out what you can do with trading. Even if it means reviewing what the market did that day after the market had already closed. Who cares if you didn't place a trade? You made yourself a better trader today somehow. Good, you're on the right path. That's what I would tell my younger self to kind of eliminate some of those frustrations. I like what you said there because it reminded me of something because when I was still learning, I, I was in a sales job. And it was the same mindset. Like I was like, focus on sales, I'll make more money which can help my trading or yep. can fuel my trading. And whilst I'm still learning to trade and developing the skill set, And I remember I'd always fall into the trap. Like I'll do that, I'll do really well at sales, start making good money and I'll be developing my skill set. Um, but then as soon as I'd start then being like, okay, I've got money for trading now, <laughs> let's put it into trading. Um, the sales would then start to decrease, of course. So mm -hmm. my income on this side would start to decrease. Maybe I get a good payout or withdrawal yep. here, cool. But then what happens is, you know, because you've rushed very quickly to try and do that, normally doesn't have longevity, comes back down on this side, but then this side's still down here. Right. So now you have to do all that work yeah. again to build it back up. So you end up in a double negative situation. Yep. And it's so interesting you said that because I think it's so important for people to really recognize that because the last thing you want to do is put all your attention on trading when it's not working yet. Yeah. And you haven't got the skill set yet, as you said. 
but then your other things diminish. Like your other things really come down, whether it's your work, so your job, your business, very important, relationships. Yep. Right, if that, all that comes down and yet trading is you haven't developed it yet, and then that's down too. Yep. It's all just gonna reflect on each other. Yeah. You know you, lo- you lost money and everything if you lose relationships over. There's a very yeah. easy way to get very bitter, I think, mm-hmm. very negative. Not only to you, normally you won't do it towards trading because that's the thing that you're wanting to work. Right. So then you end up, I think, doing it elsewhere. Like you end up being very moody at home. You end up being very resentful at work, I think. Mm. Um, Happens so easily because then you're really resentful because you're like, I'm not making any money. This is holding me back from my trading when in reality you've done it all, you know? Yeah, no, that's Um, a great point. Yeah, yeah, because I've seen it. I've seen it happen so often. Now, talking about that though, the transition from when you were doing those flips to then coming across prop firms, did you bring any of the negative sort of mindset that trading brings into the prop firms when you first found them? Let's take a break for a minute there, guys, because I want to tell you about the best trading tool on the market, TradeZella. The reason why TradeZella is the number one trading tool that every trader needs is because you can do backtesting, automated journaling, trade replay, in-depth analytics, and so much more. And the greatest part about TradeZella is that it's all automated. All you have to do is connect your MT4 and MT5. It will pull all your data onto the dashboard. You can add playbooks. You can just add notes. You can add images from your trades and you can get the insights that is necessary for you to progress as a trader. Now, TradeZella is for absolutely everyone. Whether you're a crypto trader, whether you're a Forex trader, whether you trade prop firms, it is for absolutely everyone. And that is why thousands of traders have signed up using my link here through the podcast. Make sure you use the code RIZ10 for 10% off your monthly subscription or WOR for 20% off your yearly subscription. The link is in the description below. Now let's get back to the episode. No, to be honest, it, was, it felt like an escape for me is what it felt like because I really respect traders that have been able to scale their own capital because they mm-hmm. truly have found a way to just treat trading as a business. And what I do with my personal capital now, I am happy to say I do have a, a six-figure personal account, but that is preserved capital. That's mostly positional trading, like mm-hmm. four Long months. Stuff. Yeah, and like just shares or futures. Like I'm not... I'm not even touching options with it anymore at all, to be honest, because I saw enough that like, look, I built the skill, but like I kept losing it. Um, so my personal account, I honestly, it's mostly positional trading at this point and like preserve capital. Yes, I want to grow it every year and make money there. But like, I'm really just trying to preserve it at this point now that again, I am out of the, out of the debt and mm-hmm. stuff, right? I finally have a positive net worth. Keep it that way. Don't, don't be a dumbass and send yourself double negative like we were talking about. Um, but no, I felt like it was an escape for me coming to prop firms because I could truly treat it like a business. I put some money in, I get money back out. Okay, how positive am I at the end of the month? Do it again the next month, right? And obviously when you keep accounts, there's no expenses the next month, but those are the really big months. You get a payout with no expenses, that's great. I had account turnover and stuff though. Like I never kept one funded account the whole time. Like I had multiple accounts with different firms. Um, but you know what I mean? It finally got me to, to truly treat trading like a business that it was, I put up a little bit of money I take money out because my personal account too, right? I had that number in my head up like close to 250. That's fine I, when I'd withdraw, never withdrew any money from personal accounts. So I wasn't treating it as a business. And that's why I really respect traders that have scaled their personal capital, you know, up to six, seven figures because they have had that mentality to truly treat it like a business. And I think that's really tough to do on personal capital. I do. Um, so I really respect traders that do that. It's, it's good for you to having highlight the difference because I feel like people need to understand not only that difference though it's like yes you know we respect those people but also there's like two different styles of trading and skill sets that you bring to the table mm-hmm. when using either props or personal um, because the way you trade on the prop probably isn't going to be the exact same as you trade on a personal right right there'll be very yep. large similarities probably eighty percent there yeah but there's going to be those chunks of differences that really makes a difference as well yep yeah well for me unfortunately I was more reckless with personal <laughs> money that was the biggest difference but I you know strategy was the same on both overall like I trade mostly uh, I like one hour supply and demand is how I describe it with five minute entries is how I describe my my strategy to people you say a scalper day trader uh, my average trader is a little bit over two hours. So okay. somewhere in between, right? Yeah, like yeah, I, in I the guess, middle. yeah. Like I would say, like if people ask, like, "Are you a scalper?" I'm like, "No, I'm more of a day trader." Mm-hmm. Um, but my average trade is about two hours. So, 
Yeah, like the strategy was same on both, if anything. Like props, it's it's much more straightforward, right? It's like you lose the account if you're reckless, which obviously I was doing the same thing with the personal money, but I didn't see anything really get taken away from me because I was still I still had an income as an engineer yeah. and stuff, you know, that I was like, again, I was only trading with money I could lose. And I know people are, I'm sure there'll be comments being like, what an idiot losing six figures. But like, I had the skill to make that right back. You know what I mean? So my personal account actually never went to, a net loss. You know what I mean? It was always money that I, you know what I mean? I gained profit. I lost all my profit, gained profit back, lost all my profit. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I, I was never trading with money I couldn't lose. And I am grateful for that. I wish I made better decisions, obviously, but I will say I was never, never trading with money that mm. I could lose. Would you, you know? say if you didn't go through that, you wouldn't have been the trader you are now or been oh, able absolutely. to learn what was necessary to move forward? Yeah. And I, I would have never given prop firms a try either. You know, I would have, if I didn't go through that, or you know, if I just didn't try trading at all, again, we wouldn't be sitting here, yeah, right? That's true, um, yeah. mm -hmm. So yeah, like I wish I made some better decisions, no doubt, but I don't regret it, honestly. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. I hope that doesn't come off as arrogant, but like I said, I was trading with money that I could afford to lose, and it wasn't like I was given six figures and I lost it. It was like no, I scaled an account up to that point and made some stupid decisions <laughs> multiple times. Mm -hmm. But it's not like I was ever, you know, mom and dad never handed me hundreds of thousands of dollars to go trade. Like this was a skill I built and I made some dumb decisions, but learned from them. And eventually, like I said, prop firms were finally the escape that kind of got me out of the bad habits because yeah. I could just treat it truly as a business. And when you were using prop firms, were you still trading indexes? Yeah. yeah, yep. Yeah, so CFD space, right? But I didn't trade Forex at all. Like I don't trade gold. Mm -hmm. um, currencies, I don't trade at all. Um, yeah, I know. I think that's just more like the SMC space and stuff. And I learned, like mm -hmm. I said, with US based options, contracts, equities and stuff. So mostly NASDAQ is what I trade, um, you know, whether it be CFD or like futures now, I pretty much just trade NASDAQ. Mm -hmm. um, I do like YM to US 30. I like US 30 as well, um, but mostly just NQ for me. What would you say, so because you've traded both now, mm -hmm. you know, you were kind of pushed towards futures, right? Because of the everything US. that's happening in yep. the US, right? But and I, I said this to you, I think, yesterday. I was like, I never understood that. I never understood, like, CFDs aren't allowed in the U.S. Yeah. But then prop, people just go into prop firms. And for me, it was like, that's that loophole surely will close one yeah. day because yep. it just doesn't make sense. Yeah, you know? and I'm I'm grateful. I don't know where I even originally probably picked up on it. Probably it was just me looking into, are these things regulated? What am mm -hmm. I actually trading, right? Because first time I heard about Forex prop firms, I was like, all right, I know what pips are and stuff, but I was like, I actually don't know what a CFD is. Dive into it deeper. I was like, this is illegal in the US. So I kind of knew I was on a ticking time bomb from mm -hmm. the start, but I was like, okay, like these guys are going to give me six figures in funding. I've passed their evaluation. I better like make some money here before mm -hmm. I know it's gone. Um, so I kinda, I knew I was on a, you know, short leash um, mm -hmm. or short time frame with it anyways. I mean, I had, like I said, over two and a half years with prop firms now, um, but now futures, I think they're a no-brainer for U.S. traders, honestly, and we've done a couple videos on mm -hmm. it this week. Index traders in particular, I think futures are a no-brainer, no-brainer. Would you say it's better than FX? Yeah, as far just as far even, as even just aside go. from like props, even let's say if the whole U.S. thing, CFD thing, wasn't an issue, would you say that you prefer futures? Yes, I really do. I really do. Um, just because it's centralized exchange, right? I know I'm actually getting the same price as you know the big boys, which you don't know what you're getting with prop mm -hmm. firms and stuff. And that's obviously what we've seen so many of them shut down, right? We found out their brokerages, those spreads don't exist anywhere except for that broker. That's mm -hmm. that's obviously the frustrations and the issue in the Forex world is the slippage and the spreads that seem to come out of nowhere. You don't get that in futures. So I think Forex space is, it's obviously a massive market and it's really exciting to trade for currency traders. I think if you're a US-based index trader, futures are a no-brainer. Mm -hmm. No brainer, whether it be prop or personal. I really think they're a good asset class for any index trader to, to use. How did, how did you find the transition? Really easy, to be honest. Again, being only an index trader, I think most people experience the same because the CFD is just a synthetic of a futures. You know, oh. U, US 100 is created off of NASDAQ uh, slash NQ, created off of NQ. Mm -hmm. And I actually would tell people this, you know, at high strike and stuff when I was an admin people that are trading US 100, trying prop firms and stuff, and they'd be doing analysis on trading view in US 100, I actually recommend people don't do that. I tell them to do their analysis on NQ, on ES, mm -hmm. on YM, because that is the real asset on the centralized exchange. You know, 
US 100, NAS 100 is just a made up thing based on NQ, you know? So that's why I tell people, do your analysis on the true asset. It's fine if you're executing on a Forex based prop on US 100, NAS 100, that's fine. But I really try to encourage people to do their analysis at least on NQ, on ES, on YM, because that is the true centralized asset. It's so interesting because it's like, I know there's a lot of fears or, or people really stressing about the whole CFD space and, and they're used to that space and then they're a bit reluctant to move to futures, probably because of fear, probably yeah. because of like, oh, it's going to be so difficult. I think it's just lack of understanding, yeah. Yeah, probably laziness as well. And, <laughs> I, and I say that not to judge, like I, I'm a lazy type of guy. And so in that sense too, like fundamentals is something I've been saying for a long time. I need to go learn. But laziness is holding me back. Mm -hmm. And so if I was in that position where I had to go trade futures, I'd probably be in a say, oh, no. why, <laughs> why? Until you have to, you have to, right? Until yeah. you have to. But reality being that it's good to hear that it's not really much of a transition, especially for the index guys. I imagine if you're a currency, because I know that in futures, I didn't know this actually until recently, but um, that in futures, you can trade currency still. Yeah. It's just a different name, obviously, that they use. Yeah. But is the pricing the same? And the, the, I'm guessing there'll just be slight differences then in terms of rather than lots, it would be contracts, right? Yes. So you just have to check your contract size and your tick size, which mm -hmm. we kind of talked about. Ticks are basically just pips. It's yeah. all it is, right? It's the smallest amount that an asset can move. That's all. Um, but like ES, for example, one point on ES is $50 net loss or gain. So you're basically getting 50x leverage on the S&P 500 when you trade one ES. NQ, same relationship, but 20. And then Dow is five. So I don't trade currency futures. I have to check. I believe um, like the Euro USD, I believe it is five. So you know what I mean? You have to check the tick and the contract value there. So um, it's similar in the sense that like you need to mind your size. You need to know, you know, how many pips my stop loss in relation to my account size, of course. Uh, but the pricing and sizing is going to be different than just straight up lots. So that's what I would say if you're a Forex trader and you have no issues with CFDs, mm. I would say stay there, honestly, if you're a currency trader, I would. It's mostly the index traders, you're gonna get better execution. And if you're in the US, you don't really have another choice right now. Yeah. Uh, but I would even say the- that security. You know? Yeah, exactly. And that's what I would even say, if you're a you know, Forex based platform trader right now that is trading US indexes, I would really encourage that person to go look into futures, whether or not your country is having issues with CFDs or not, because the execution is much better. It is much better. Because there's, there's also the case that you can have both. Because yeah. I don't really hear yep. people do talk about that. Really yeah, you can much. diversify. One, yeah. one or the other, that's true. it. That's so true. Versus, yeah. Futures no, versus you're, yeah, forex, yeah, you're absolutely yeah. right. You're absolutely right. And I, I do think most people, I think the U.S. is responsible for that. <laughs> you maybe, know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I think it is. It's the regulation in the U.S. that's responsible for that. But. You know how you said it was easy for you to mm -hmm. transition? Was there an element, because you seem like the type who, as you talked about, like problem solving, and you seem like the type who's like researchers and just, like you said about the CFD space, like what is this I'm trading? Yeah. Versus just doing it. You know, I'm the type where I'll just do it. Yeah. Find out the details later, which has really bit me in the ass <laughs> yeah. recently. Yeah. Um, but it's a lesson to be learned there for sure. But do you feel like more people should just do their, if they just do their due diligence, for a short period of time, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I don't imagine you sat there for weeks on end trying no, to look at this stuff. No, a couple of days of homework, really. Yeah. And you, you'll be prepared to go. Now, like if you're a brand new trader, you've never traded before, course, yeah. that transition's gonna be <laughs> tough. But if you're any sort of experienced Forex trader, I I promise you'll be able to pick up futures if you're willing to put in a few, literally a few hours of homework, honestly. Yeah. A few hours of homework is all it would be. You've been told, you've been told <laughs> now. In terms of risk-wise, as, as a strategy, like. Do you have like a fixed risk or a dynamic risk? This is a question I've been asking because yeah. when I speak to some of the you know, very successful people I've spoken to, mm -hmm. they're more on the page from what I've been speaking to them about, of more dynamic. And yeah. when I also listen to a lot of interviews um, of really successful traders, like some of the world's famous yep. uh, successful traders, they're always talking about dynamic as yeah. well. Um, so what, what, what position do you have? I've kind of learned the same. I started out as like fixed risk all the time. And again, as I've, you know, got to meet some amazing traders and stuff in my journey, the big boys I kept hearing talk about dynamic risk. So I am more towards dynamic now. Like I add to winners a lot. That's how I pretty much got most of my big payouts is wow. I go into a position, right? Again, I trade, I like the five minute and hourly. Pretty much five minute gives me my entry. I go in with like a normal size somewhere around typically 0. 0.4 to 0.6% risk is typical for me. When on the hourly, that starts to show that trade going my way, right? We're approaching imbalance fill, you know, moving 
off of a support towards a resistance. Once the hourly shows me that I am correct, that's when I look to add to the position. But I do not, I don't martingale, like I don't add to losers. Mm -hmm. It's now that the position has gone my way, right? And this is what prop firms really made me adopt because once your account is protected from drawdown, right? Like stops at break even on the original position, we're good. What I really look for is I like trailing my stop on the five minutes. So let's say we get five minute high or low, trail my original stop up. So we know we're making money on the first trade. That's where I'll add is where my new stop is trailed up mm -hmm. to. So the add is almost a, right. It's going to be a break even trade or it's going to be a nice reward for myself. So that's how I try to approach it is, you know, I go in with a somewhat set risk. I don't ever really go over 1% is like my max max for starting in position, but that dynamic risk is where I really look to add to positions because because the account I know will be at break even at a worst scenario, right? Because if that ad goes red, I've got the original stop loss from the original position trailed up as well. So adding to positions is huge for me. And that's what I've, again, I've learned from kind of watching the people doing extremely well. They talk about adding to your winners. They don't talk about adding to your losers, right? <laughs> yeah, that's that's a, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But they talk about adding to your winners. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've found. My, my biggest months were, you know, a couple of nice trades that, you know, the hourly was moving my way. I got two or three ads on the position and all of a sudden, you know, that's a 4% gain yeah. on the account. That's a great payout by itself, you know, and there's been months I've been able to do that like twice in a month, you know, and like, that's obviously a pretty good month. Um, so yeah, I've definitely adopted the more dynamic risk, the, in my journey. Mm -hmm. Um, but I still try to have a set parameters, right? Like I don't ever try to risk more than 1% while not starter position ever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it is, it does fluctuate. Like I said, like typical, like 0.4 to 0.6 depending on how much I like the setup, but it's not fixed every time for me. Like I said, it's so interesting to hear because of, I was in the Forex in particular, I don't know if it's a Forex thing, I don't know, but like you really just hear about 1% risk, like don't risk yeah. more than 1%, yep. stick to that, you know, and you'll be safe. Like that, that's the way to do it and that's how you make money. And um, it was so interesting just hearing these different traders and veterans and, and famous traders and, and successful traders talking about dynamic risk. And when they explain it though, it makes so much sense. Because it's, the way they explain it is essentially like, if you expect to make millions, like if the famous uh, trade George uh, Soros, I would believe it was, and uh, how he bankrupt the pound is his famous story. Mm. He put all of his net worth into that trade because he just believed in it so much. Yeah. Like he put everything he had into that trade to make billions, like, I don't know if it's billions, but like hundreds of millions basically, and become a, like he's famous for that trade. Yeah. For the sake that he took the risk, like he knew that he backed himself that much, and maybe he shouldn't back himself that much. I don't want to say net worth because I'm not sure about that, but he backed but, himself yeah. to a high a amount, lot, yeah. right, to be able to make that reward. And other traders talk about it, not in, a, in the same fashion, maybe that much, but like in a very similar fashion. When they've had their big trade, that millions, a lot of the time it's similar to in a similar case to what you've said, where they have a buffer. Yeah. So essentially, with yours, it's like you have a buffer because you've already broken even. So now you have this risk is available again. Yeah. Right. And um, I think that's it's so important to highlight just so traders can understand. Again, can you make money with fixed risk? Of course. Mm -hmm. Of course you can. Um, and is it advisable for new traders? I would say yes. Yeah. As well. I think that that dynamic element comes with experience. Yep. Absolutely. Well. So I don't want to sit there. And, no. <laughs> you know, I also don't want to sit there and be like, hey, you're a new guy. <laughs> go, yeah. Go risk this and that. No. Right. Um, well, I think you've had the same learning thing. I, I what I always tell members mm -hmm. and stuff as I'm mean, say, earn your big positions. Mm -hmm. You got to earn them. You should have them. Like, obviously, over trading and oversizing as again the new trader that's going to kill you. But if you have proven you have a profitable edge, like build up the buffer and you built a skill to prove you earn those big positions. And that's exactly what you hear like market makers talking about how those guys make ten million on a trade. They put up 20 million, right? But like they've earned the right to those big trades because they've built up profitability for years. So I think, you know, I don't want to encourage oversizing, but I think, you know, most experienced traders should be having a couple big positions mixed in because, you know, you might be on a hot streak. That is the time you have, you have the buffer protecting the account. Go for it then, right? It still has to be, you still have to be taking a high probability setup, a good setup and everything, but like earn your big trades. And when you see it, take them because that's how you'll really get those big payouts or get the big profit on a personal account. They have to be there. They have to be there to make real money, in my opinion. You mentioned earlier about you know, having those trades where you can add to them, the, mm -hmm. basically the trades that end up being quite bigger in terms yeah. of the reward. What's the reality of how often they turn up? You already mentioned about you yeah. might get one or two of those a month. 
right? Yeah. Well, what is the reality of that? Because I know a lot of people always, they, they think every trade is going to be like that. Yeah, no. So I don't trade like ranging markets well at all. And mm. I, you know, we, we kind of have a joke like in the high straight group and stuff in the community there. They were just like, Ben loves trend days. And I do, you know what I mean? Like that's where I make my money is trend days. Ranging sideways markets, small movements in the S&P 500, I make almost no money on those days. When you see NASDAQ move two and a half percent in a day, that's usually what I'm in on because I caught an entry, let's say like dip in the morning, but then we make higher lows all day. It's just like, man, I could have just followed the trend all day. Those are the days I make my money. On the days that we don't get a very clear trend, I don't do very well. I don't make a lot of money, right? It might be a lot of break even stopouts or, you know, actual losses, of course, too. That's typically when I see myself losing a lot are those range days. So I would say when you see big movements on indexes, just like a pure trend day, that that's usually me. Those are my big days. Mm -hmm. That's what I catch. So yeah, a couple times a month usually. Um, I wish it was like once a week would be nice, <laughs> yeah. right? Because of course you get the weekly candles they are just doji prints. That's when I just have to, I, I do like using the weekly chart a lot because that's actually what helps me recognize, oh, am I going to get a trend day this week or not? Um, weekly dojis kill me and my strategy, kill me. So whenever I see like a doji starting to print, I'll typically be like, all right, I'm sizing down or I'm just not trading today. Because I know for me and my strategy, like weekly doji prints, not not kind to me, not kind to me and my strategy. I like that. I like that you mentioned that in terms of the weekly time frame because even as someone who's sort of day trading, scalping in, in mm -hmm. between, like short term basically, yep. how important is it to use that higher time frame just for reference, just oh, for... Uh, you know, making decisions off the back of that's everything. I think I don't. I don't know how I wasn't using the weekly, which I feel like I wasn't using it until probably year four. Mm -hmm. Year four, five, six is probably when I picked it up. Um, I don't know how I wasn't before, because like before everything feels like it was guesswork. Before, well, like yes, I was building a strategy similar to what I use now. You know, what I mean, focused on the hourly time frame mostly. Mm -hmm. um, just the weekly now again, it, it kind of it points out to me like, oh, I might get the opportunity I'm looking for. You know. I don't know if it'll be Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, but like it's coming this week based on the weekly chart. Cool. I need to lock in because mm -hmm. again, this is going to line up well with me and my strategy this week. That is what the weekly chart is telling me. So I don't know how I was making decisions without it before, to be honest. So it's completely built into my analysis and strategy now. So I can't imagine not using it anymore. I think it's so interesting because I, I know that loads of traders get caught on the one minute yeah they just they get really caught on the well not even just the one minute but lower time frames in general they just get caught there yep and i think if a lot more traders would probably find a lot more success and when i say success i don't mean more winning trades necessarily i think just taking less losers yeah so therefore and i've always said this i've always said the best thing a trader can do is learn how to take less trades and make more profit Right. And how do you do that? You just literally stop taking the shit trades that are causing <laughs> yeah. many losses, yeah, yeah. right? And how do you do? And it's so easy to be said. I know someone's gonna be sat there like, yeah, it's so easy to be said. Yeah. But the reality is, is like if you just learn the mis common mistakes you make or the areas that go against your plan, or a lot of the time, unfortunately, loads of people are just sucked on the lower time frames. If you start to look at a bigger, that's all you do as well. That's a simple one. Look at the bigger picture. What's that telling you? Anything that goes against that bigger picture on the lower time frames, try and reduce down on and not take action on. Right. And instantly you've taken less trades, but made more money, not because you took more winning trades, but you've just taken less losses. So imagine, let's say per month, you take 10 trades and you take four losses, or let's say you take six losses and four wins, right? But four of those losses were actually invalid or just you know, because you're yep. just looking at lower time frames. Suddenly you've taken, and you risk 1%. Suddenly you made 4% more, not by taking more trades, but just right. because you took four less losses. Less, yeah. You know, yep. and I think that's the biggest hack, if anyone wants a hack, that's the biggest hack you can ever do. Because you're not doing more work, you're doing less work. Mm -hmm. And yet you're making you're making more money off the back of that. And that's yep. like the best thing ever. Um, but obviously it requires a certain mindset to action that. Yeah, you know? yeah. I think it's just creating some sort of if then statement for mm -hmm. yourself. And that's what I mean for me. If I see a weekly doji print, then I am not gonna <laughs> trade as aggressively. You know, it's picking out something there, um, mm -hmm. whether it be technical How or fundamental. How did you realize that though? How did you realize that you were better at the trends versus the range? Just looking at where my profits were, you know, what I mean, like legit, legitimately. The nice so thing is data collection. Like yes, yeah, yeah. Which again, prop firms really got me into. Obviously, dashboards collecting mm -hmm. and everything mm -hmm. for you. That's really when I started getting. You know, I wouldn't say I'm obsessed with stat tracking, but like I was like, okay, where's my most profitable day? Why the hell did I lose so much money on that day? Like, what was I doing? And you need to be reviewing as a trader if you're gonna learn at all, right? You need to be reviewing your trades. And again, unless you're 100 hit rate, like, and you are making. Five, 10 mil a year, hey, don't listen to me, fine. But if you were 
anywhere else in between. You got to be reviewing your trades and what you're doing well or not at all times, in my opinion. So that's really where it just came from was I had an understanding from the beginning, like, hey, on good days, I need to review what I did well. On bad days, I need to review what I did not do well. Mm -hmm. And that's what I just found was like range trading, just not for me, especially being, you know, a day, day trader, not a scalper, my average trade being two hours. The days I make the most money are those longer trades that mm -hmm. we trend for a full four hours. Like mm -hmm. that's again, that's where I make a lot of my money. And that's what I noticed my average trade time starting to climb. So on days we get a good trend day, that's where I make all my money. Days that were flat or maybe reversal, right? I get stopped out of break even or small win there. Um, because like, right, we get start start mm -hmm. to trend my way, whether it be up or down. I start to trail the yeah. stop, start looking for an ad. Ad doesn't come, gets me stopped on the very small trailed stop, mm -hmm. right? Like and those are the days that I'm like, ah. All right, well, let me go look at the weekly. Yeah, it's a doji. All right, I'm done for the day. Like, they're pinning us here. Again, I just don't trade that well. I don't trade that well. How about handling drawdown? You know, when you're in drawdown, is there any particular protocols you have in place? Anything that you've struggled with in the past that you had to overcome? Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I've failed um, evaluation accounts before. Like, I did not have 100% pass rate mm -hmm. and stuff. So, um, if anything, I feel like the drawdown was almost forced because I just wanted the account so quickly, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, right, I was like, oh, I want to pass. And well, once I passed my first one and like I got paid out and stuff, I was like, oh, all right, I've kind of figured out a system that works here. And then I was like, well, I wonder if I could pass one in a day, right? Which was just stupid, but like I wanted to see if I could do it. It's like, obviously never happened. Just kept like putting myself right in a drawdown, trying to speed it up, basically. Mm -hmm. That was the biggest thing was, I think the drawdown honestly was created from trying to do it as fast as possible. Um, and I think most people are just like, oh, well, just don't do that. I think <laughs> I think everyone that's traded prop though, they'll be like, yeah, I know what he's talking about. I tried yeah, to do the 100%. same. And I finally, it's just finally having a wake up call to, I need to change my ways, mm -hmm. right? Um, but the drawdown, I don't really change anything in the strategy or anything mm -hmm. like that. Maybe, uh, I mean, if I take like a full 1% loss, maybe I'll size down for mm -hmm. a few days just cause I'm like, damn, like that hurts, you know? Um, but as far as like dealing with drawdown, try to keep, you know, everything the same, try mm -hmm. to keep it even keel, right? Um, pretty much it's it's only when my strategy changes when I get that buffer we mm -hmm. talked about, because then I start looking for the big opportunities. Is But when I'm drawdown, small or large drawdown, or, you know, break even or very small mm -hmm. green, I would say my trading looks very similar throughout those. It's when I get up, like, let's say three, 4% on the account, that's when you'll start noticing like, oh, like took a big win a couple of days later. Um, Cause like I said, I feel like I've earned my big positions at mm -hmm. that point. But I would say, I mean, draw down to small green on the account. My trading is gonna look very similar throughout those phases. How about in terms of profits then? The other yeah. side, like is there profit protocols? Do you stop or cap at a certain point of profit or do you just go until the cycles complete, let's say payout yeah. cycle, et cetera? So uh, there have been times when I'm like, I wanna protect that payout, I'm not gonna, trade again but there's no like number in my head that i'm like i have to hit okay. that you know i try yeah. to i think if that worked the market would move how we wanted it to every single day mm -hmm. so i just try to always take right take what the market gives me some again those trend days that's going to be my big weeks and months um is recognizing if i get like that two percent two and a half percent move on nasdaq i'm probably not getting that again the rest of the week like that's when maybe i'll call it quits for the week is mm -hmm. when i've caught just a big movement in the market like, and I might not be looking like, oh, sweet, I made 8,000 that day. I'm looking like, nope, that was the trade I was really looking for. I was hoping to catch this week. All right, I'm going to either not trade the next two days or I'm just going to take it very light. Because right, I was working with traders as an admin every day. So most days I was still at least placing trades or helping them place trades, you know. Mm -hmm. So there was never really any day, unfortunately, that I could walk away and like not be paying attention to the market. But there were some days that I was like, I right, range bound, low volume. I'm just like, I can't execute on this, you know, so... Uh, but there's no particular number that I was like, okay, done for the week. Um, it's just looking for, hey, is that market opportunity there? And if it's not there, that's when I call it quits, not necessarily monetary value. And one thing you mentioned about your journey was two to three months, well, not two, three, two, three months, sorry, two years mm -hmm. was like one segment, and then the next two years. Yeah. And around the four, five year, four, five, and six is where you start to really see that profitability. You know, and you've spoken to a lot of traders as well, being yeah. part of that community. Is there any, like on my, from my observation and my own journey, my journey was about three years, three mm -hmm. and a half years of profitability. From what I've looked at so far, obviously there's people, there's exceptions of course as well, very large exceptions from people who take longer, way longer, yeah. people way shorter as well. Yep. But on average, I've seen that most people take about three, three and a half years yeah. to really develop the skills, start to develop the skills. So not like massive profits, yep. but just really start to 
get to a point where they're starting to see some form of profitability. You know, from from your experience and you know, observing a community and being involved in a community, quite a large one as well by the sounds of it, is that something you've seen as well? Yeah, so I would agree. So coming in right before COVID, it felt like I saw the absolute worst, like everybody losing their net worth <laughs> and stuff in the dip, and then the exact opposite on the way up, right? Mm-hmm. You saw people all of a sudden deciding they were profitable traders when mm-hmm. they just got a massive bull run for a couple months. Yeah. So I almost saw both sides of the coin when I was still a very green trader. And I think that was huge for me to understand, like, is that person actually profitable or do they just catch a run? And like, damn, that guy just got shafted by the market. We got a, you know, a 20% dip on the market nobody expected because of a world pandemic, right? And like trying to find the balance of like, all right, was the market actually that crazy? Is this guy actually that good of a trader? Seeing that just with other traders really helped me kind of just get into the mindset of like, this is gonna take a while, you know? Cause I was seeing people go from really, really great traders to losing everything and people that had no business trading, making a ton of money. So getting to see both of those is, that wasn't my first exposure to the market. I think that helped me adopt a much better mindset. Mm-hmm. Um, just because I was like, there's no way all of those people are really terrible traders and all of those ones are really good, you know? So that, that just kind of was like, I need to see a bit more market cycles mm-hmm. before I truly feel confident in it. And it just lined up well with my time frame of the three year mark mm-hmm. too. So what's your goal with trading? Where where is it that you want to take it? I don't to be honest, it was always to get out of debt is what it was for me, you know? And like that's that was a big milestone. Of course. Freestyle. You know what I mean? Like the well, like the easy answer would be like, oh build my net worth to seven figures. That would be awesome. Right. And I think anybody <laughs> would would agree that's what they want to do mm-hmm. too. Um but you know I want to have trading open doors that I wouldn't have had otherwise. It already has, right? It got me out of engineering. Um, but what I want to continue to do, I mean, I'm wearing the hoodie now is, you know, we're launching Alpha Futures. Um, I want to use it to help traders catch their big break, to be honest, is what we're looking to do. And what I mean by that is, you know, something we're very excited about is basically doing tracker accounts that tracks your performance as mm-hmm. a funded trader with us over your lifetime of trading with us and like help traders build a resume because I feel like I got to a skill point that if I could have got 10 mil in funding, I think I would have probably got to that seven figure mark, right? And profits Mm -hmm. pretty easily. I don't want to say easily, but you know what I mean? Like my percentages beyond perform that, you know, if I could have built something that can help traders find that big break, that's really what excites me now is like, yes, I'll still be trading myself all the time and stuff, but it's now getting to build a business that, you know, my goal is to help traders catch their big break get found like help them build a resume as a trader you know and be part of a community so that's obviously what i'm walking into now but it's honestly what i want to be doing too is like i wish i could have found something that you know i've proven this skill with prop firms they have all my data you know i mean i I wish there was like something that was collecting it lifetime that's exactly what we're doing here so I'll be doing it myself. I'm, I'm not allowed to trade Alpha Futures accounts. That would be conflict of interest, unfortunately. But I'll still be trading futures myself, I mean, every day. But helping other traders, like, find those really skilled guys out mm-hmm. there, guys and girls out there. And if we can help them catch their big break with the connections, you know, the ACG team has in the space, that's what gets me fired up now is, you know, being able to build that. Because it's what I feel like I've been looking for the last three years when I have really built a really profitable skill. I was like, man, I wish I had the connections that, I could be trading with 10 mil, you know, because mm-hmm. I have never scaled to that point. Like I said, I have so much respect for traders that have scaled their personal money to that because it's amazing, amazing. But like, I haven't figured that out yet, how to do that. I hope I do one day. But if I could have resources that could maybe open the doors for me to get in the rooms with people that, you know, have um, accredited investors that do have 10 mil to, you know, work with a high level trading team, that's what I want. And that's what we're trying to build now. So. So you're saying that the funded traders on the funded stage through mm-hmm. Alpha Futures, for example, they will, when they're funded, they will, their dashboard and their data on the dashboard will continuously. Right. So like, let's, yeah, like, let's say you lose your funded account, mm-hmm. it will stop then. But if you get funded with us again, it will pick up continue. from there and continue. So, right. Like the idea is like, I could take that resume, that portfolio performance, mm-hmm. I could put it in front of accredited investors for you. So whether it be, you know, you actually want to keep trading or it's just showing, hey, this like this guy or girl understands market movements. Look, like they know what they're doing on trading. Who knows what kind of professional opportunities that could open up for you, like at a financial institution or something. That's that's what really fires me up about our business model. And that's honestly what you were, um, I can remember if you, you or Dan that asked was like, hey, did you approach Alpha? They approached you. They approached me originally as like, 
hey, you're a U.S. trader that knows what he's doing. We're thinking about doing this project. What do you think? That's what I really brought them was the portfolio idea because that's uh -huh. what I wish was out there. It was mm -hmm. like, man, I feel like I'm doing something really, really right and I don't have the doors open to get to those accredited investors, to those institutions. That's what we're gonna try to do here. And that's, mm -hmm. that's kind of my passion project part of what we're launching is that. The future space is, or the future's prop space is so interesting because I feel like it's so, I, I had never really come across it, which is interesting because obviously I, of what I do, obviously I speak to traders, futures traders, options traders, I speak to all kinds of traders. So you would think I would have heard, I've heard of firms, like mm -hmm. one or two, but only recently. More so because CFD space mess and all the chaos there. So you, I, and I, you don't really find a profile. You don't really see much on them. And I heard that one firm, I don't know the name, so I'm not trying to bash them or anything. I, yeah. just, I don't know who they are. Um, but I remember someone saying to me like they don't have a dashboard; they just email accounts. That's uh, that's Apex. Really? <laughs> yeah. But yeah. I just find that crazy. Like, yeah, how does that no, work? Like, you just email accounts to people. Yep. Um, which, hey, if it's working, it's working. Yep. Like, I'm not gonna, I'm not hating. Yeah. I'm just like, that's no, crazy. I, there's things I dislike yeah. too, and that's obviously, again, I think that's why the alpha guys approached me. Mm -hmm. They're like, hey, you're a consumer, like, a somewhat smart guy. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? They're like, you're not dumb. Um, but they're like, we know you've tried around futures firms and stuff, like what needs to be improved, what's good, you know, and like that's obviously how we're building out our offer is taking feedback from real traders like mm -hmm. myself that have used the product, continuously used the product. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there's there's a lot that needs to be improved, but you know, there's a lot of companies that are doing it very right. Like Top Step has been around since 2012. Yeah. People don't realize that. You know what I mean? They're, they're way way before FTMO. People yeah. don't realize that, you know? Yeah, I didn't. Yeah. Um, and I, I, yeah, I didn't either until probably two years ago that I was like, oh, yeah. Because the FTMO was my introduction to the prop space. Yeah. They were the first one I ever tried. Um, and I knew what top step was shortly after, but I was just like, no need for it. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So I didn't dive into it, but yeah, I mean, top step's been doing it longer than anybody. They do a ton of stuff. So right. Like mm -hmm. they are definitely operationally, you know, I'll be transparent. Like that's what we want to match operationally. Like they are an incredible company. Um, there's things with other firms that, you know, I, I not trying to bash, but like, I just personally disagree with, and we'll be doing things differently. And I, you know, I, continue to wish them success. Um, they can obviously do what they want, but like, yeah, there's tweaks I wanna see made to the industry. Um, you know, and I'm grateful to be given the opportunity to do it with Alpha, a really good group of guys there. Do you have any worry at all? Cause we've seen what happened with the CFD space. Yeah. And uh, over the last 18 months-ish, we saw how many new firms were just flooding yeah. the market. And um, you know, a lot, a lot of the reason I don't want to say a lot of the reason, but a lot of the negative stuff that ended up happening was more so just that everyone started undercutting each other, trying to make yeah. it the best thing ever. Yep. And of course, you know, it's good to have USP. It's good to be unique in some way. Yeah. Separate yourself a little bit. But do you feel like there's a, is there any worry in the future space of that happening there? Of course, there is a worry. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just to be transparent with you, we're going in with a competitive offer. Nothing crazy because exactly, we're not trying to undercut everyone. We're going in with an offer we feel is fair to traders, of course. Um, but like you're saying, not just trying to undercut all these other firms. Like, again, what Top Step is doing is working, obviously. Like, they are a very solid firm and stuff. Um, yeah, we don't want to be the ones going in all of a sudden, be, you know, giving traders unrealist expectations or giving them too much, like, trading freedom, like no rules or anything, right? And then we have to implement rules later. That would that's suck. An interesting that one, would actually. suck. And that, that's what we're seeing in the Forex space yeah, right now. Yeah, I've seen to, that so many times. It was so weird, you know, because... Um, with what we, we had, we had launched and we had, and I remember thinking like, well, we could do this way better. Other people have launched yeah. and they've got this, that and the other. And I used to feel like, why can't we just do that? And then we didn't, we didn't do it. And we, we always had like a very, not I wouldn't, it was competitive, but it wasn't like, it wasn't unique. It was like other people had way more unique offers, yeah. right? And they were probably getting a lot more traffic, right? Mm. And I saw it time and time again, new people launching, yeah. really crazy offers. Bit, loads of traffic and we were still just kind of like introducing new things here and there over time but equally what i saw with the same people who would launch with like a bit of unrealistic expectations maybe really demo conditions yep. trading the news you know lot size uh, limitations like really all these things suddenly after they've got all this traffic then they would put these put limitations the in place. yeah and i always yep. just found like I get. I guess it works. I, I don't know if it was a tactic. I don't know if it was like purposely done or if it was like a, a way to Maybe, manage yeah. risk. I don't know. Right. But it was always, in, that's why it's so unfortunate in my eyes, like what happened to us because it was like, we tried to do things in a more sustainable manner from day one. And still we yeah. ended up like this. Um, 
And it's just, it's, it's a very, it makes me wonder, I, I hope the future space obviously just lear- gets to observe our space and yep. learn, okay, that's where they messed up. Right. Let's make sure we do it right over here. But I do feel like a lot of CFD guys um, are trying to jump over to futures. And I think a- ACG are, are like, they're clued up guys. I said this in a in a video when I was explaining what happened to us is like, go to firms where pe- where they have people who understand the industry. Right. They have industry experience. Yep. Right. Versus an influencer or versus someone who's just may have had a business before, yeah. right? Or he's just trying to make money from the trading industry yep. because they, were, they failed at trading and then suddenly they, they find this as a way, right? Right. Um, and they might be good at it, right? They might be good at maybe managing the business for a certain amount of time, but as we've seen, right, this is a perfect example of it, it's not good enough, right? Because if they don't know how to manage a book or risk or understand any of these things, data, um, and more, I would say more more than anything, longevity and the dynamics of the industries. If they don't understand that, it's not going to work. Right. And I think that's why ACG, I think they, they have a great team. And I think they have a good balance of skill sets. Right. Agreed. Um, and I think that it's quite unique to see. And I think I'm very happy to see it, to be fair. And I feel like FTMO probably has that. That's why they've been so good at what they've done. Probably Top Step have that by the sounds yep. of it on yeah. the future side. Yep. That, well, they definitely must because it's been yeah. 12 years yeah. of them operating. And so. a lot of their guys are, you know, they worked at the CME. A lot of their there guys, you, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, same, same thing with like Alpha. Those guys are all institutional background. Mm-hmm. Top Step almost the exact same that, you know, yeah. they're all institutional background. Do you US. feel like that's the f- the... For longevity, that that should be the future of any firm, really. At least, I don't, I don't know if you have to be institutional background um, because, like, I'm not. You know what I mean? Mm. But yeah, but you I mean, to, have, a, you have, have an least, element of it. Yeah, you, it? yeah. So you at least have to be right. You have to at least be a consumer and a trader, right? Mm-hmm. Like, if you're if you're not a trader starting firms, like like you said, if you're just like an influencer that started. Um, like a firm and has no knowledge of the market, like that's when things are just gonna, they're never gonna be right, mm-hmm. you know? And that's what we saw with a lot of firms that all of a sudden just gone poof. Mm-hmm. Cause the person running it wasn't even really a trader, you know? And it's scary that that was allowed, but that's a, I, don't, I mean, I lost a funded account and stuff from some of the firms that have gotten shut down and everything. It was actually two, I lost like 400 K mm-hmm. uh, like right away. And then, you know, ACG eventually had to boot me off too. So like, I obviously don't have any funded accounts in the CFD space anymore. Um, but you know, I mean, the first, first props to go under are the ones that were just no knowledge behind it. So I think it, it's more important is the knowledge than the institution, mm-hmm. but of course, institutions are going to teach you the knowledge. So yeah, yeah I agree. Like it's, it's great to have mm-hmm. an institutional whether or like in the U S maybe like a series seven or something, but like if you have the knowledge and have done the the research, I don't know that, you know I mean? The certificate's necessary, but the yeah. knowledge is necessary. Mm-hmm. Yes, no doubt, no and doubt. Are you excited for the, the future? Is there any insights you can give us now or are we gonna have to keep an eye on? Um, you're talking like timeline or what? Timeline or, I don't know actually, I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> 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 but more so like in terms of, uh, well, you already told us actually, to be fair with the track record and, and yeah. You know, managing that, so that's fair enough. But leave us with uh, an interesting one. I always ask my guests. Sure. So it's a new thing, shall I say? Um, I used to do a, a quick fire questions thing, actually, which I'll, I'll bring that back just to, just for some fun, and then we'll go into the newer thing. So the newer thing is like a motivational speech. Like you get a <laughs> thirty second to sixty second right. motivational speech to the audience. But we'll do that after. The original quick fire question was actually this, which was if you could meet anyone, famous or not, dead or alive. Oh. You know, past or present. Um, who would it be and why? I haven't asked this in a very long time. So the yeah, audience, audience hopefully the, our, yeah, our OG members will be like, wait. Thing. <laughs> Honestly, it would probably be Michael Burry. Michael Burry? I think so. Yeah. I think so, because like, he's just seen as a, a madman, mm-hmm. but obviously like the big short worked. And obviously like where I am now, um, you know, I don't always agree with his takes and everything, but like mm-hmm. I think would probably be able to sit and talk with him for hours just because like he's known to be such an interesting guy. Yeah. But then obviously everything he's accomplished too. Um, yeah, I think it would just be like endless knowledge and we'd probably disagree on some things like it, right? He's like- He's still short. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> you know what I mean? But like, okay, why? Dude, like yeah. what do you see that you're always short? And you know what I mean? Just yeah. getting to talk with somebody like that, I think would just be, it'd probably be like overwhelming. Mm-hmm. To be honest, that's what I was thinking. I was like, all right, what would connect with like, obviously where I want to be in the future, yeah. working with like hopefully institutions and whatnot. But I was like, all right, who would have like the most, just like 
unique takes. I feel like it would be him. You know what yeah. I mean? He probably have the most unique takes of the industry. And he's obviously somebody that's made, I mean, billions of dollars. That's obviously cool to speak with anybody that's 100%. ever done that. You Especially know? to call that. Right, the, yeah. The great financial crisis of our time so far. Right. Yeah, so far. yeah. Well, yeah. You don't know what's to come. Well, if you ask him, there's one coming way worse. And that's what I mean. Like, just to get to yeah. be like, dude, Was what fair, you To be fair to him, though, even though he's been short for a very long time, um, but to be fair to him, he's not the only one who's saying it. Right, right. Yeah. It, over, over. I'd say the last year too, since like inflation's really increased, mm -hmm. and since uh, the Ukraine um, Russia war, and now that we're seeing all these elections taking place as well uh, this year in the UK and the US, we're seeing loads of people saying it. Yeah, I, I don't want to say like famous people though, but it was more so like a lot of traders are saying recognizable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're they're indicating it. They're saying a lot of people are just saying that data's saying it. Yeah. So it's not even they're saying it. They're saying look. The data is saying this, or we've never been at this point ever yeah. in history. Which I agree, the data is mm -hmm. showing it. It also said it in the whole run up, 2020 and 2021. Yeah, true. And we, we you know, I mean, uh, they like, turned the printer on that time. What? But what? <laughs> Mega. <laughs> what is what is stopping them from doing it again? Yeah, it's true. It that's what the, you true. know. What I mean, that's what mm -hmm. FOMC. Th that's what Powell does again and again, mm -hmm. and. Like, it's obviously not just him. It's FOMC as a whole. <laughs> and, like, yeah, I'd say Powell because he's the one that has to deliver it. Yeah, he's the one that's delivered the speech. What's stopping them from doing that forever? Very we don't know. You know what I mean? We don't know. And that's what I mean. I want to – Burry, I think, would be so interesting because he, he'd probably be like, no, that's stupid. And, like, that's what I, mean. I want to hear his takes, you know? Guarantee you ACG will find a way to make that, <laughs> make that a reality, you know? They'll know someone who knows someone. Yeah. <laughs> but the final one. Look down this camera. <laughs> And this is your moment to have a, what's the famous, who, who doesn't fame, like, uh, have you ever seen Coach Carter? Yeah, yeah, you yeah. The famous, famous speech like that or any other motivational speech you've ever seen, this is your moment. Cool. Okay, put on your motivational yeah. speech, voice. All right, <laughs> cool. Just uh, down here. Cool. Whatever's going to help traders out there, you know, help them excel, help them progress. Cool. Yeah, I don't know, I'd like to think my story is relatable for most people just because of the college, that, especially the U.S. traders. Um, trading scary, but it does have the power to change your life. And like we were talking about, look, the involvement and the commitment for me was, has always been the same for the six years of my trading career. You got to make the commitment. That's really, if you're going to take this seriously, that's number one. I'm not asking you to be a good trader from day one, not asking you to understand everything from day one, but for example, I'm going to do a lot of educational content at Alpha Futures. I plan on helping a ton of traders. If you want my help, all I ask for is that commitment and, you know, me, Myself, Planty, the other, you know, guys that have been doing this for a while at ACG, we want to help you, you know, the same reason Riz does this podcast. He wants to help traders, help them progress. He would probably ask you the same, you know, if you were going to come chat Forex with Riz, commit to it. That's all. Commit to it. It's not going to be easy. It does have the power to change your life, though. It has changed my life, and I know it will continue to. So I encourage you to try it. Just make sure you truly commit to it. Don't half-ass it. Don't half-ass it. I love that. I love that. I said a challenge to my barber the other day. Yeah. Because uh, I've told him to start making content, um, you know, so many times. And he right. hasn't done it. So then I sent him a challenge. I said, if I, by the time I come next, if you haven't posted this piece of content we've yep. been discussing, you give me a free haircut. Yeah, there and you if go. You, if you've done it, then I'll pay you double. Yeah, right? <laughs> nice. So far, he hasn't done it yet. Oh. It's only been a couple of days. So we have to see. But that, that's what, going off like you were saying, commitment though. Right. You just have to commit. You can't talk about ideas. Well, yeah, you can't you, talk about You're not telling them to make a perfect yeah. video. And that's how, like I, I've, I've obviously, I do an Instagram content and everything. I did at high strike, you know, been able to build my personal page a little bit and stuff. But like, if you go back to the early days mm -hmm. with the reels and stuff, they were horrible. <laughs> you know, they were horrible. But like, you know, it's. It's just making the commitment to mm. do it. Like I said, the with, the, uh, with the baseball. Yeah. You know, same things like you were you were good, but then if you wanted to get better, the only way to do that is to <laughs> turn up, be determined, push yourself. And uh, no, I love it. Ben, it's been absolutely incredible. I'm sure we'll do this again sometime. I have to get you onto a futures roundtable thing. Yeah, sounds you know? good. 100%, we'll definitely do that. Everyone, drop a comment of your biggest takeaway from today's episode. Uh, the links for Ben will be in the description below, so make sure you check that out as well. Uh, there'll be other videos on screen, the day trading show as always, past episodes. Make sure you hit subscribe. And until next time, take care.